Taksim to get us started. My name is Mark Kligman. I'm director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. We welcome you to today's program, which is the first of a four-part series with Asher Chasha Levy, and we are so glad that you're with us. Before we get the program underway, we'd like to share with you different events that we have upcoming through the Lowell Milken Center. Our next program is this upcoming Thursday, and it's a program that's called Mireot or Mirrors. It features the works of six women uh, Jewish composers and uh, also with an interactive roundtable that's this Thursday. And you could just find this program through our website, UCLA MAJE, UCLA Music of American Jewish Experience. Then we have a two-part Yiddish music uh, workshop featuring Ethel Rehm and Sarah Meyerson. We hope you can join us for Sundays, May 16th and 23rd. And then a really unique work, which is a George Washington's letter set to music by Jonathan Kamisar. And that is on June 2nd, on Thursday, to bigotry, no sanction. And then our last program of the year with Ben Holmes, a uh, noted Trumpet, trumpet player, this will be a album drop or an, a release of a new album. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our host for tonight's event, Professor Sarah Bunin Benor, who's a professor of contemporary Jewish studies at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Los Angeles. In addition to her responsibilities and her activities at UCLA, she is also the director of the Jewish Language Project, looking at Jewish languages around the world. So with no further ado, Professor Sarah Benor, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Welcome, everybody. We are in for a treat tonight. Uh, I am the director of the HUC Jewish Language Project. Our mission is to promote research on awareness about and engagement surrounding the many languages spoken and written by Jews throughout history and around the world. And one of the ways we're doing this is by presenting concerts and other programs that highlight Jewish linguistic diversity. Now, when we think about prayer, we often think about Hebrew and maybe Aramaic, but Jews throughout history have prayed and done liturgical acts in other languages, languages that they spoke or languages that their ancestors spoke. And Jews in America are continuing that tradition. We continue that tradition by praying in English, Jewish English, but we also continue that tradition by praying in languages that our ancestors spoke. And this is what Asher Shasho Levy is going to be focusing on tonight. And we're so excited to hear his own music as well as some of the recordings that he has found. Asher. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. Um, this is just really an exciting series for me because uh, this topic is very near and dear to my heart. Um, and tonight we're gonna be particularly focusing on liturgy for the upcoming holiday of Shavuot. In the Turkish Judeo-Spanish tradition, it would be said Shavuot, and in the Syrian tradition, they would say Shavuot with a, a bet as opposed to a vet. According to Syrian Hebrew conventions, there's only bet. So um, I'll be pointing out different uh, particularities of pronunciation uh, according to each community. But before I dive into this very particular repertoire of Shavuot in Judeo-Spanish from around the Ottoman Empire. We want to situate this liturgy in the context of um, 
a history of Sephardic poetic practice and musical practice that goes back to uh, to Spain before the expulsion, but that's really not the time where most of these works were written. Um, the source of this tradition, much of it, is from the early Ottoman poets, such as uh, Israel Najara, who I'll be talking about a little bit later. But I want to start really with some music. We'll get into um, what this is all about in a moment, but I think the best way to get us going with, is with uh, a pismon, is with a song of praise, a paraliturgical song, so a song that is not part of the fixed liturgy, for instance, shaharit, minha, arbit, the morning, afternoon, and evening services all have fixed prayers, and Amida, Shema Israel, all these basic prayers. Um, in many different communities, there was a, a poetic tradition around the Mediterranean of different categories of song, Pismonim, Bakashot, uh, Piutim in general, and then in Ladino, which we'll get on, Judeo-Spanish, we'll get into later, the uh, Complas and Romanzas. But we'll start with a, with a Pismon that's in the classic Syrian tradition, um, composed by Haham Rafael Antebi Tabush, who basically in Syria and Aleppo in the 19th century, he revived the tradition of pismonim, of creative, poetic, paralit paraliturgical songs that had been um, somewhat dormant for the past century, I understand. Um, so this piece, Ro'e Ne'emanhu, the reason I'm starting with this, even though it's in Hebrew, I think it's important to understand the Hebrew texts and images that are then referenced in some of these Judeo-Spanish texts. So there's a, there's a milieu, there are concepts that are shared among the Mediterranean traditions. So this one from Aleppo, um, like many of the other poems, uh, stands a spell out in acrostic, the name Raphael, from Haham Tabush's name. Um, he was an outstanding composer, he was a scholar. He composed between, they, they say between four and five hundred pismonim actually. And something really important to note about Hacham Tabush's work and also most of the different traditions around the Mediterranean is for the most part the melodies were not original. They were contrafacta. They were taken from popular tunes to the extent that Hacham Rafael Antebi Tabush, they called him the thief because he would go to coffee shops, Arabic weddings, social events to listen to new songs to invigorate the repertoire with something contemporary. And that's very important as we talk about these vernacular liturgies because the liturgies that are shared between Jewish communities around the world all speak of things that are in common to Jews. But each community has its own particularities, its own er interpretation, its own take on a given day or holiday. Um, so this pismon is a contrafacta of a very, very, very famous song called Salam Afandina. It was written by... Um, actually an Italian composer, Giuseppe Puglioli. Um, and the reason this melody is so famous among Sephardic Jews is it was the national anthem of Egypt from 1871 through 1958. And as a result, you'll see this melody in Turkish communities, Greek communities, uh, Egyptian, Syrian, and then, uh, of course, in the Yerushalmi community of Jerusalem. They use it for the, actually, the hakafah of the Torah and every Shabbat. Uh, uses the same melody. Um, and paying attention to some of the text here, uh, this idea of ro'e ne'eman uh, is actually reflected in some of the Ladino works that we're going to look at later as pastor fiel. So some of these terms are directly translated from the Hebrew poetry um, into Judeo-Spanish. And this is in a uh, the mode of ajam, major scale, which is uh, associated with uh, celebration and holidays. Israel, 
Which, in a sense, you wouldn't necessarily think this would have much to do with these vernacular Jewish liturgies and languages other than Hebrew, because this is Hebrew, obviously, and it's using a lot of language that's very familiar from the liturgy and from the Torah. But the reason this is important to situate the vernacular liturgy in this context is because of how much it draws from a common tradition throughout these different languages in the Ottoman Empire. So the Syrian Jewish uh, texts in Judeo-Arabic share a lot of imagery and a lot of concepts with uh, these different Judeo-Spanish texts from neighboring communities such as uh, the Constantinople community and the um, Salonika, Rodos, all of these different uh, communities share a lot in common. Um, so before we get into the uh, Ketuba de la Le, this, uh, this compla, this rhymed Ladino poem, uh, from the 18th century, it's important to understand where this concept of a ketubah for Shabuot comes from. So on Shabuot, what do we celebrate? A number of things. It's harvest. Um, it's considered to be the end of the period of Pesach. So we count the Omer, these weeks, counting up to Matan Torah, this moment where the people uh, received Torah in this, this incredible revelation that many of these poems uh, focus on the aspect that this was of revelation for the entire people. So all of the people reached the level of prophecy. And so the way that the, um, the poets of the Sephardic tradition, um, beginning with Israel Najara uh, in the 15th century, conceive of this happening at the Matan Torah at Har Sinai is as a wedding. So these texts were written, um, the Ketubot, these texts that are marriage contracts, basically, between God and the people of Israel, and um, explaining these different elements of the contract and what each party would have to do for the other. And it's really quite, quite a, beautiful, a beautiful tradition. So I think it's, it's good to start with the original Ketuba de la Ley, um, as they would call it in the Ladino-speaking communities. It's the Ketuba Shel Matan Torah that we have. Um, and in Syrian communities, this would be sung uh, before the taking out of the Sefer Torah in Turkish and Greek communities where the Ketuba de la Ley is done in Judeo-Spanish on the first day. There is a, a tradition to sing the Ketuba in Hebrew of Najara on the second day. 
So before I go through it and before I uh, explain it, why don't we listen to a recording of uh, Gabriel Shrem, one of the great Hazanim in the Syrian community in Brooklyn, um, singing this ketuba. So Lori, whenever you have that recording for us, um, we'll take a listen to it. On the first day of Shavuot, which is a feast of wheat. Not this one, the other one, actually. Which... The scratchy one. Say the ketuba for Hajj at Shavuot, which is also a tradition. Ya Rabbi Dabi Lugano La Ruga Tule Shamo Lutale Shaybat Nadi Ver Prozale Asukat Shilomo Atiriona Shalu Amele Shilomo So, it's, it's not a great quality of recording, but it really presents the true melody in its authentic form here. And this melody is one that's very common, actually, for many purposes in different Sephardic communities. Um, you'll hear it used for pieces on the Yamim Noraim, on the High Holidays. So, Ima Fes Roba Hakan is done to this melody. This is a famous melody among the uh, different Sephardic communities in Jerusalem that have this tradition of singing the bakashot, of these songs that are sung in the winter months in the middle of the night. The first of the bakashot is sung to that melody, El Mistater. Um, so it's a common melody. It's not. It's probably not actually a contrafacta. This is probably an original melody um, to these Sephardic communities around the Mediterranean, though I don't know that for sure. The text here starts, Yara dodi le gano la arugat besamo. So my beloved, this, these are all images from the Song of Songs that are then being, um, so the Song of Songs is interpreted by many rabbis as being about, not, not like this erotic love poem, but a, a sort of an interpretive notion of, of a relationship between God and the people Israel. And that's where this concept from the, for the Ketubah of Shavuot comes from. So, Yarad dodi le gano le arugot besamo. My beloved has gone down to his garden, to his bed of spices. Um, Lehit ales imbat nadib, lifros alea sukat shelomo. To rejoice with the daughters of nobles, of uh, important people, and spread the sukat shalom, to spread this shelter of peace over her. And apirion asalo amelech shelomo, King Shalomo made the canopy for him. Um, very, very beautiful. And we'll, we'll, I'll sing a couple verses of this, and then we're going to move on to the... Um, Judeo-Spanish ketubah. So I'm going to sing this two ways. I'm going to sing, um, the first is the Yerushalmi and Aleppo melody, which we just heard, and then I will transition into a different maqam so that we can hear some of the melodies that come more from Western Turkey, which are the same melodies as the Ladino ketubah de la ley. <laughs> Amen. 
يوم حتونتو ويوم سمحات لي بوم And now the melody from Western Turkey which is in uh, Maqam Siga Maqam Siga or Sika as it's called in Arabic is an important maqam in all of the various Jewish communities of the Mediterranean uh, of Sephardic origin and also of Mustarab origin of uh, I guess indigenous you could say to the Middle East origin Mustarab um, because this is the maqam that's associated with Torah uh, the Torah is chanted in the Greek Turkish Syrian Jerusalem Egyptian traditions using uh, a melody that's in this maqam so in these communities where these poems are sung on Shabu'ot, in that maqam, there is a, uh, a spiritual meaning to it. It's alluding to the Torah. Similarly, the melody that we just sang is in a maqam called Hosseini, which is associated actually with the Ten Commandments. And the Arabic word is, uh has to do with glory and, and um, something that it's a quality that is associated with the Torah. Um, so here's the uh, Western Turkish melody. Okay, so this ketubah is the basis of the extremely popular Judeo-Spanish piece that's sung on Shavuot, that is, uh, the fo that's what I'm going to be focusing on mostly today, called the ketubah de la ley. So the ketubah, the contract of the law, de la ley. So this piece was written, it's a, first of all, it's a compla which is a type of Judeo-Spanish song. So most of the Judeo-Spanish songs that are sung today that people know, uh, La Rosa en Florece, Los Bilbilicos, Cuando el Rey Nimrod, uh, etc., etc., these songs are romanzas. And so a romanza is sort of a romantic popular song, whereas these coplas are uh, more religious. This is a classic example of what we'd call paraliturgy. So these are pieces of liturgy that were written written for various reasons. So why would you have a ketubah that's written in Judeo-Spanish? Well, many people were not fluent in Hebrew and didn't really understand, in particular, women and children. So at this time, there was less education that was done for women, uh, and so many of them many of them could read but didn't understand Hebrew. And so these, um, in fact, it's actually been suggested, uh, I believe it was David Bunis who suggested, that this type of liturgy started to become popular in the Sephardic world um, when they saw the success of Trinus and Yiddish, basically Yiddish paraliturgy for women that was published around Europe by the same publication houses in some cases that printed these Ladino works. But in any event, this Ketuba de la Ley was written in 1753 at a time where there was a great flowering of Sephardic literature, particularly that in um, Judeo-Spanish. And this piece basically, like the Hebrew Ketubah, it lays out this notion of a contract between God and the people of Israel, and it, it connects everyone there who would understand this in their native language to this sort of chain of tradition that Shavuot celebrates, a, um, a chain of consciousness, this historical chain. Um, 
Much like some of the other pieces we've looked at today, the author's name is spelled out in an acrostic. It says, Ani Yehuda Bar Leon Kalai, uh, and it is based on the piece that was written by Najara that I just sang, because both of these songs speak of this covenant at Sinai as the marriage. So uh, before I uh, play it myself, I think it would be good to listen to the version from uh, Sephardic Bikur Holim in Seattle. So many of these traditions have been carried on into the New World uh, with particular strength in Seattle, where the Sephardic community is very old, it's very well established, and there are two synagogues. One, Bikur Holim, is mostly um, people whose ancestors came from Western Turkey, and the other one, Ezra Bisharot, is mostly uh, individuals whose ancestors came from the island of Rodos. And the two traditions are very similar, but they're also different enough that the, um, there's a lot of beauty in those differences. And in fact, today, for all of these texts, I am using a mahzor that was published by uh, Hazan Ezos in Seattle. Um, you can see it here. This is Mahzor Zichron Rahel um, from the Seattle Sephardic community. And it is a, it's a wonderful publication, a beautiful, beautiful book that has within it many of these Ottoman Judeo-Spanish texts, such as the Ketubah de la Ley, as well as an interlinear translation of the Book of Ruth. If we had more time today, um, I, would, I would do a little bit of that. Uh, as well. But we're going to focus on the Ketubah de la Ley first. So, Lori, why don't we listen to the version from Sephardic Bikur Holim? We're going to hear Hazan ben Aroya and his group of Hazanim. They're going to explain what the Ketubah is, and then they're going to sing a few verses, and you're going to be able to hear sort of the call and response that makes this special. Uh, each verse is three lines, and the last line is repeated. I'll explain before we listen to it just what the first verse means. Um, it's razón de alabar el yucrande y poderoso. So it is fitting to praise the God of greatness and might. Con temoridad y corazón y alegría y gozo. With fear in the heart and joy and delight. En el día el este santo y temeroso. On this day of sanctity and awesome fright. Um, and then it continues into this account of how God descended upon Sinai with the angels of God and he gave the Torah through the hand of Moshe Rabbeinu, Mano del Moshe Rabbeinu, Pastor Fiel, Faithful Shepherd. Faithful Shepherd, like the Pizmon Ro Et Ne'eman that we just sang. And it goes on that God did not choose a high mountain. God chose a, a humble Mount Sinai in order to um, celebrate the virtues of the meek. And the way that's, that is said in the Ladino is in Hebrew. Uh, porque... Te prende el hombre y tome la anava, la anava of, of humility, I guess, uh, por manto. So we'll go through it more as I sing it, but let's first hear the Hazanim from Bikur Cholim. On the Whenever first day of Shavuot, which is a feast of weeks, which uh, commemorates the giving of the law on Mount Sinai by God to the Jewish people, as part of the service, the rabbis have instituted what they call the Ketubah de la Ley. The Ketubah means the, he the Hebrew marriage contract because they vision the giving of the law to the Jewish people as a wedding. So therefore, there was a contract. And we sing it after we take out the Sefer before the Sefer is read on the first day of Shavuot. <laughs> de corazón y alegría y gozo en el día el este santo y temeroso en el día el este santo y temeroso Sinai, 
Israel, por mano de Moshe Rabbeinu, pastor fiel. So we get a beautiful sense of this Ketubah de la Ley and the way that it's chanted in these communities. Um, Traditionally, as, as the Hazan mentioned, this is chanted before the reading of the Sefer on the first day of Shavuot. Um, I'm going to play a little bit of this in the way that I learned it, the Western Turkish tradition as comes through Istanbul. And then we'll listen to another uh, regional version from, from Western Turkey. Um, one of the fascinating things about this song is um, it's, there are many, many recordings uh, by women of this piece. So this was a piece that was a popular among the unique repertoires of Jewish women in the Ottoman Empire. Most of that repertoire was in Judeo-Spanish rather than Hebrew, but this was a widely, widely uh, published piece, and it was very well known in all of the different communities um, that were Judeo-Spanish speaking. So to avoid any, any uh, confusion, I've been talking a lot about uh, Syrian, Aleppo, Sephardic Jews. These are communities that are Sephardic in the sense that they come from Spain, but they're not culturally part of the Judeo-Spanish milieu that's more in Western Turkey and in Greece. But that being said, I think more is made of the differences than the similarities, and it's very good to understand that most of the customs are very, very similar, except for the fact that in Western Turkey, Central Turkey, you ha and, and in Greece and in the Balkans, you have this use of Judeo-Spanish that died out in Syria by the 18th century. So by the time this was written, uh, people weren't really speaking this anymore in Syria. The Turkish version of Ketubah de la Ley. So let's go back to some, some source recordings so we can hear differences in the melody. It's, it's all fundamentally the same melody around the communities of the Ottoman Empire, but in different cities, different towns, there would be different forms of ornamentation. Uh, the Turkish music has a system of makam, of makamlar, as they say in Turkey, makamat in Arabic, that are these musical modes. The difference on one foot, the difference between Turkish and Arabic comes down to uh, the microtonal ornamentations and the tuning. So Arab Arabic music is lower tuned than Turkish music, and Turkish music has a system called commas, where every 
whole note that you would have every every like a like a G for instance in Western music is broken up into eight. So there are eight eighth tones, and these sort of micro micro tones give the quality to Turkish music that's really essential. And all of these pieces in Judeo Spanish are they take the the um, the style. They're in the style of classical Ottoman music. Um, so there's there's actually a lot of similarity between um, Sufi Turkish singing groups that you'll sometimes hear singing these um, you know illahir, these songs of uh, of the Sufi tradition, and they're done in the same way actually as these Judeo Spanish songs. So let's hear. Uh, we're talking about how this is largely uh, intended to reach women and other people who were not. Um, part of the, the in-group, you could say, in the synagogue. So let's hear a version by, um, I believe, Berta Aguaro from, uh, from Tranakale in Turkey. Um, and you'll hear some slight differences in the melody, a little bit more ornamentation, uh, and certainly a beautiful version. So, Lori, whenever we're ready for that. <laughs> Y poderoso con temuridad de corazón y alegría y gozo en el día el este santo y temer. What an incredible Israel. recording. Absolutely beautiful. And if anyone is interested, um, feel free to get in touch with me if you'd like to hear more recordings of native Judeo-Spanish speaking women from Turkey singing this particular uh, this particular compla because it's really really an incredibly beautiful and unique, unique tradition. Um, so I'd like to actually, um, before I play a little bit more, I'd like to give everyone a little bit of a sense of, of, of the context um, in which this would happen. What is Shabuot looking like in Ottoman communities uh, at the time when these pieces were written? Uh, so I'd like to read a few quotes that I've taken um, from different, different people uh, from the Ottoman Empire who, who remember Shavuot. So uh, in the wonderful book, um, A Jewish Voice from Ottoman Salonika, uh, the Ladino memoir of Saadi Besalel Levi, about this incredible Ottoman musician, um, it's a wonderful book by Sarah Abravaya Stein, Aaron Rodriguez, really just an incredible book. I highly recommend that everyone uh, look at it. Um, he, Saadi, this, this musician, this, this well-known musician uh, of the Ottoman Jewish and Ottoman world, recalls what Shavuot was like. He says, my father was religious, and one Shavuot Eve, he went after dinner to attend a study session, according to the custom of the Jews, when they would go all night to the synagogue and no one stayed home. So this is referring to the, the Tikkun Lel Shavuot, this, this gathering where a different texts from Torah and the Kabbalah are read all night. Um, that time of the year, nights were shorter. Dawn broke early. Around 6.30, people would come back to home to eat the enchusa, this cheese and spinach pie, uh, the frittada, with some sotlaj, the rice pudding, and then go back to sleep until about 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Other people went touring the parks, while lower class peoples with their wicker baskets filled with cheese pies, rice pudding, raki, 
huevos aminados, went with their families to the parks on the outskirts of the city to eat, to get drunk, and fall asleep on the grass. Most of them returned home sick. So this is a little taste of what maybe we could have, we could have had in, in, in Ottoman Salonika. Um, another, another quote from, from rabbi and historian Michael Molho from, from Salonika in his book Traditions and Customs of the Sephardic Jews of Salonika. He says, they would pray and spend the night of the festival in holy readings and songs of joy. They would then arrange to spend some time outside the city in the middle of green fields under a blue sky. So there's this, this constant uh, element of outdoor recreation on Shavuot, actually. Very early, they would leave the city via one of the gates of the city walls, taking with them baskets full of these provisions of, uh, of the enchusa, the, the fritada, the huevos aminaros, the salads, and the sotlach, prepared with goat's milk and well-cooked so that the pudding takes on a light coffee color and the surface is full of wrinkles, like the cheeks of an elderly lady. Naturally, there is no shortage of raki. So really a joyous time uh, in the lives of these communities um, to be celebrated. And we're really, I'm really grateful, uh, in particular in regards to what we're talking about today, to the community of Seattle that has preserved the particularities of these different customs by micro-community, by city, by island, etc. Um, you know, here in Los Angeles, we have Sephardic Temple Tiferet Israel, which preserves many of these Turkish, Judeo-Spanish traditions. But that, that community is a merger of two communities, like in Seattle, um, how there are two communities. Here in L.A., those Judeo-Spanish-speaking communities merged. So there is, um, it, the, 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 here in L.A., the tradition is being uh, preserved, but it's not, not, the, not the minute differences, I guess you could say, between roads and western turkey between you know smyrna and constantinople um so really really many thanks to that community to the hazanim hazan ezos um and others who really do do a lot to preserve this heritage um and with that i i would love to open it up for some questions at this point Wow, thank you so much, Asher. Well, before you give uh, take questions, as people are thinking of what they would like to ask, I just want to say thank you because we learned so much about Shavuot or Shavuot, and we learned so much about uh, various Sephardic communities and about the practice of prayer in other languages. And I like that you brought in the uh, tradition of women singing and specifically chanting uh, for other women. Mm -hmm. um, and so my, my question is about that. To what extent was this Ketubah de la Ley um, gendered? And would women sing it for other women? Would men sing it in the synagogue for men? Were women present in the synagogue? Can you tell us a little more about the gender angle? Yeah, so definitely like all Sephardic communities, um, I would say highly gender segregated, but at the same time, not necessarily um, to the same extent that you would see in, in particularly among the Hasidim of Eastern Europe, where um, you know, you wouldn't have men and women necessarily even sitting together at the same meals singing the songs. In the Sephardic tradition uh, of the Ottoman Empire here, the men would sing it in the synagogue, and the men would be the ones who would sing the text um, before the reading of the Sefer Torah, which of course was also read by the men. But it was done, so, so I, I, I've sort of ascertained, it was done largely for the benefit of the women who would then sing it amongst themselves as well. Um, so there, there are definitely different angles. The women's tradition was more private and more among the women themselves for themselves, but there's overlap because the same pieces would be sung by men and women in the synagogues. Here, these coplas are shared, but um, as I mentioned earlier, there's the romances repertoire, these sort of romantic songs that before the era of recording really were the um, domain of women. And then starting it with urban Ottoman recording in late 19th, early 20th century, these songs get picked up by men. So really, there's more credit should be given to the women for preserving a lot of these songs in Judeo-Spanish, because in many cases, the men weren't doing it. They were, um, so there's the Maftirim repertoire, which in Turkey is like the same as the Pismonim repertoire in Syria. And so there would be a men's choir in the synagogue, and they would sing all of these things. And... Many of these pieces in Judeo-Spanish were more, um, yeah, more the domain of the women. 
Great, thank you. And people asked for the names of the two books that you mentioned. I think it was yes. a Jewish voice from Ottoman Salonika. That's right. Uh -huh. Yes, and that's Machzor the one. And Machzor Zichron Rachel. Yes. And, okay. Um, I, I put the titles yeah, in, those in the, the chat. Wonderful. Okay. Now, uh, what other questions do you have? Feel free to put them in the chat. Anyone? Also, someone wants to know how to get in touch with you. And I said, we'll be posting some of these, all of the recordings that you have access to that are in the public domain uh, on the Jewish language website, as well as the images of the texts themselves. Um, and if people want to get in touch with you, what should they do, Asher? They should email me. Um, at You can email me at asherlev at usc.edu. You can connect with me on Instagram, Asher Shasho Levy. Um, at Asher Shasho Levy or on Facebook. Uh, and I just welcome engagement over these really special and precious texts and prayers and, and liturgy. Great. Well, I see uh, a question here. Yeah, Someone is asking me, what is my heritage and background? Um, so I'm half Halabi Syrian. My, my father comes from uh, the communities of Aleppo. So meaning Aleppo and also the surrounding towns that are today in Turkey, uh, Kilis and uh, Gaziantab. Um, my mother's family are Ashkenazi. And um, I also grew up here in LA uh, attending the Tefillah at the Sephardic Temple Tiferet Israel, where I learned a lot of Judeo-Spanish from, you know, various communities. Uh, we have you know, we had uh, Salonic and Holocaust survivors. We had, you know, second and third generation Americans who descended from families from Western Turkey and from Greece. And so, you know, particularly when I was growing up, you know, let's say, I don't know, starting maybe 15 years ago or so when I was uh, after Bar Mitzvah, when I was starting to really pay attention to this stuff, uh, it was just a critical juncture. And it's still a very critical juncture because so many of these people are very elderly and um, people don't know to ask them to sing these things. If we don't know what a ketubah de la ley is and we don't know, you know, what the Megillat Ruth interlinear Ladino version, we don't know about the Azharot and Ladino, all these things. Um, and when I was young, I didn't know from this particular Mahzor. Uh, these books with the Ladino interspersed have only made it to L.A. more recently out of Seattle. So what would happen is, and this was common in many communities, there would be printouts that would be placed between the pages of what is really a Portuguese Sidur, the uh, Di Sola Pool, sort of American Sephardic Nusach is what it's supposed to be, but it's really, it's really like Portuguese from the 19th century. Um, but yeah, so my background personally is, is Syrian, but I've had the privilege and the opportunity to, you know, live amongst and learn from people from various various backgrounds, Mediterranean Sephardic backgrounds. Okay, there's also a question about your history with the Oud. How long have you played and how, how did you learn it? Hmm. Uh, well, I've been playing the Oud for, for many years. Uh, I started I started on guitar. Most, most of the music that, I, that I've learned uh, was taught to me by my dad who's a rabbi, a musician, a hazan, and this, this goes beyond the, the Sephardic music, even just to, to know how to play music. I have to give credit to my father for that. And, um, you know, my dad is, I, I would say, he's, he's a player of the oud with the purpose of being able to accompany himself uh, in, in singing. I'm not a studied oud player, and he taught me the basics of the instrument, you know, the, the things that make it possible to play it, how to hold the instrument, how to hold the pick, basic scales and things like that. And from there, what I did really was ap applied the knowledge that I had from the Sephardic community of the Maqam system to the Oud. And in the years since, mostly I have not studied Oud with Oud teachers. I've corresponded with different Hazanim and different, you know, uh, experts on Jewish liturgical tradition of the Middle East and applied what they sing to the Oud. So, um, today, because I'm focusing mostly on the repertoire of Greece and Turkey, I'm playing a Turkish oud, which is tuned higher. It's tuned to E, like a guitar, and it has a particular sound that, um, it's, it's just, it's the sound of the music. It's a little brighter, it's a little higher, and the ornamentations tend to be more of this variety. Very fast, almost like you would have on a, on a tambour or a saz. That sort of thing. As a, 
opposed to an Arabic music, it's a little bit more... Uh, it's more deliberate, whereas the Turkish is very fast. That's more, more typical of that, so... I see another question. Is the maqam system related to the melodic system for Muslim prayer? Yes, it's the same. So you'll hear, you know, the adhan will do the, the call to prayer in Nahawand or in Bayat or in Sika or whatever. It's exactly the same as among Jewish communities of the Mediterranean who have different maqamat for different, um, for different purposes, basically. So in the Turkish Sephardic community, um, the makamat are preserved and they are uh, they're used and they're known, but it's not the emphasis that there is on, I guess you could say on theory really that's maintained in the Syrian community. Which you know, if you go to Brooklyn to a house of someone who is either a hazan or is involved in a minyan or something like that, there'll often be a calendar that lists the makam of the week, the mak the sub makam of the day things like that. In the Syrian community, every service of Shavuot is divided by a different maqam. So the first evening is different from the first day, which is different from the second evening, so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, you know, the maqam system is the fundamental building blocks of, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say, pretty much all music from the Balkans through Central Asia. You know, you're not gonna, I, I've had the tremendous privilege to be able to make music with uh, master musicians from Western China, uh, of the Uyghur people, and we did not speak any language in common whatsoever, but they use a system called Muram that's based in the Arabic maqam as was filtered through Persian influence. So even in Western China, there's something that is familiar, that feels like home. Yes, yeah, similar to the different Ashkenazi Nusach for each holiday, Shabbat, Rosh Hashanah, etc. So, similar, but more, there's more precision to the way the makamat are, are used because there are, you know, there's, for, for, the, for the Ashkenazim, please correct me if I'm wrong, there's, uh, you know, there are a couple of different Nusachot for Shabbat, there's one for Friday night, there's one for Saturday, a couple for Saturday morning, there's one for Mincha, then there's the Shalosh Regalim one, there is the Yamim Noraim 2, I guess, and maybe two sub ones within each one. But imagine if you had a different Nusach for every single Shabbat of the year. That's another level. That's, and so as a result, there are, oh, how do, how do I say this diplomatically? Um, I guess, okay, there are Sephardic Hazanim of the Jerusalem style who are more stylists and tend to be fancier but less precise in terms of actually, you know, they might do the same maqam every week and they might ornament it differently every week, but they're not as well versed in the Yerushalmi tradition as the Syrians who came directly to America or Latin America and brought those old country traditions. Same thing oftentimes in Israel among Turkish Jews, you'll find their music to be very Arabized, which does not reflect the actual sound of Ottoman Jewish music. Um, so in Seattle, some of these, you know, you think that you hear the accent of the people speaking. These are, you know, in some cases, second and third generation Americans, but they do a better job at preserving the old country traditions of their grandfathers because there was no competing similar tradition, basically. And I'll just point out that uh, it might seem odd for some that there is this tradition of makam that is so reflective of the Arab milieu, but we do this in America too. You know, we might sing Adon Olam to the tune of a song from Hamilton or Rock Around the Clock, right? And and so it's the same kind of thing. We're taking music from our, our milieu and we are incorporating it into our liturgical traditions. Uh, now, who knows if uh, 400 years from now, people are going to be singing Adon Alam to rock around the clock as a, a remnant of the of Minhag America. <laughs> but um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a similar thing. And it's also um, interesting what you said before about people, people who have these traditions being elderly and really now is the time to document them. The same is true for language. You're talking about musical, liturgical traditions, but we also need to document endangered Jewish languages, um, especially the languages of Iran that have been very 
little documented. There is a lot of documentation about of, of Ladino and of many varieties of Judeo-Arabic, but very little of Judeo-Shirazi and Judeo-Hamadani, Judeo-Kashani. And so at the Jewish Language Project, we're, we're trying to raise awareness about those diverse Jewish languages and uh, for the need for the urgent need for documentation. Yeah, definitely. And, and to go back to your point about, uh, you could say, like Nosa America, um, the Syrian community is, it's, I think this is very, very important to note, how the Syrian community sort of exists with one foot in a, you could almost say an idealized space of, um, of their past from different eras. So it's not a real representation of Syria per se. Um, what is Syrianness to Syrian Jews? It's not Syria. In fact, many Syrian Jews aren't even from Syria. They come from what's today Turkey or Lebanon or even the land of Israel or Egypt. But Syrianness is the consciousness of a certain sort of Arabized Ottoman urban milieu from a certain time in the late 19th through early 20th century, as filtered mostly through communities in, you know, in the east coast of the United States and in Central America. I have a friend who traveled to Israel a few years ago, and knowing what I do with this music, started asking people about Syrian Jews. And he said most people had never even heard of it in Israel because they've sort of been lost to the greater Mizrahi consciousness. Whereas in America, you're SY, you're Syrian. It's like a, it, it's a thing. Um, and it's also, as I mentioned, it's, it's a specifically Syrian American. So you would have had melodies that um, in the early 20th century, certain Strauss waltzes, Sousa marches, patriotic songs, God Bless America, even Christmas carols were all set to Pismonim. And this is a part of the tradition that isn't necessarily dwelt on quite as much because it's, it, it, it's people don't know how to necessarily approach this. Do we want to say this is, you know, an assimilation or what is it? The way I look at it actually is this is just a continuation of exactly what was done in Syria. People listened to melodies, they heard them, they liked them, they wrote Hebrew words to them. So it may seem a little awkward to hear, um, oh, what's the one? It's a Christmas song. Um, I'm trying to remember what the name of the Christmas song was that uh, maybe my dad will remember. O oh, Tannenbaum. O oh, Tannenbaum. Thank you, Mark. That's yes, that's the one. It's the O oh, Tannenbaum has a pismon and it has an Adon Olam setting. Right. Adon Olam Hashem and it's really strange. The first time you hear it, you're like, what is going on? But that's part of this unique American Jewish experience that is not limited to the better known Ashkenazi communities. You know, Sephardic Jews definitely Americanized in, in unique ways. Was that the first time that was ever played on the Oud? <laughs> oh, you know, I would assume it's been played in the past in Brooklyn somewhere. You know, it's definitely not going to be the last time you're going to hear that on the Oud. <laughs> Maybe we'll do something around uh, Hanukkah time about Christmas songs in the Syrian Jewish tradition. That's a fun one. <laughs> okay. There's another question about how the Chazanim learned these makamot. Was there an apprenticeship program? How long did they spend studying? It's a great question. So in many uh, Sephardic communities, there is no way to study this. And so it gets lost. And so we have big issues of people um, losing the microtones, not understanding. It's such a complicated system because it's not like scales. So you can have a, a, a makam like bayad. But if you play it in a different key, it's a different makam. And if you don't play the first notes first and you play, if you do, it's already different. It's Husseini. So it's a very precise uh, way of study. But the way that this is learned is from, I, I would say this is not chauvinism on my part. I don't think. I think the Syrian community has done the best job at pedagogy in terms of this. In the Turkish community, there's no formal pedagogy in terms of the makamlar. Um, things are sung and people learn it that way. Whereas in the Syrian community, People study makam by makam from a very young age. So, so elementary school children, when they learn how to chant the Torah, you know, they learn like the the ve'ahavta, the ve'ahavta, edadonai elohecha becholim abecha uchol nafshecha, chol meodecha. That's siga. With the emphasis on the microtonal third degree, 
it's very hard to learn, but if you're five years old and you're learning it, it becomes a part of your ear, your abilities and your, your awareness. Um, and then another point is that oftentimes in these uh, Syrian communities in North America, Central America, South America, you will have Hazanim who come in from Israel, and they have to be re-educated, basically. They have to forget everything they know. They can't, you know, say things like resh, like the Israeli ra, because to Syrian Jews it sounds like a rimel, like a, a soft rimel. And they can't say uh, tzadi, like Israelis say. They have to say sadi, like an Arabic sad. Differentiate between tet and taf, differentiate between ayin, aleph, all of these things which many Israeli hazanim are not so careful with. And also, they have to basically conform to the Aleppo style or the Damascus style, depending on which community. Um, and forget all the fancy stuff that they do in Israel, which comes from Iraq and Morocco and all of these other places. And the last question is, is this related to flamenco? Oh, I love that question. It's a great question. And the answer is absolutely not. Um, I find that there's a lot of similarities between Sephardic music and flamenco music that are, I don't want to say they're coincidence, there may be accidents of geography, I would say, but flamenco music, which I am in no way an expert on, I believe it is a more modern form that significantly postdates the expulsion of Jews from Spain. We don't really have any music that comes from Sephardic Spain, by the way. Very important that you not be fooled by people trying to tell you that 20th century songs are 15th century songs. This is very important to me. If you have any questions about any of this, uh, you can ask me, and I can also ask, I can give you information of other people who are actively researching this, but um, I think that's very important. Uh, there has been I don't think it's good or bad. It's an artistic choice. There has been definitely a move to recording lots of Sephardic music in a flamenco style, which, in my opinion, it sounds nice, but it's it's problematic for various reasons. This is music that has a style, and that style is Turkish music of the early 20th century, So to, and Greek as well. So you'd be hearing instruments that were common to Anatolia, to Asia Minor, to the Ottoman traditional ensembles. Like I have behind me here, I have a lavta, I have a saz, and I have a chumbush, and these are all instruments that you would hear. You can hear them on recordings, in fact. Haim Effendi, um, you know, Sak al Ghazi, these early recordings from the early 20th century. Um, but there's been a trend towards recording, I would say, Sephardic music in two styles, primarily, neither of which I'm fond of, flamenco or medieval. And they can sound good, but they have nothing to do with the... Um, with the music itself. I would say that Moroccan Jewish music has more in common with flamenco um, geographically, but also in terms of the fact that both are non-microtonal systems that uh, share something of the music of the, of the Middle East and North Africa. That's very vague, but I'll just, I'll just show you. So in Morocco, you have something called called Sika Spagnolite. So nothing to do with the Siga that we did today. Sika Spagnolite is a flamenco scale, basically. So, so it has two thirds. So it's that. And so that's very flamenco we having the, the differing thirds. But in terms of this music, no. And is it related to Indian raga? Uh, not related, but it's comparable in certain ways. It's microtonal. It's uh, very oriented to times of day and moods and things like that. And it's a, it's a modal, non-harmonic system of music. So related in a way. Great. Well, Asher, I know we all want more of your music and your wisdom, and we're in luck. We will get that over the next three months when we have continue, a continuation of this wonderful series. And thank you, and I'll turn it over to Mark Kligman to close us out. Thank you, Sarah and Asher, for a great program. Sarah, thank you for your um, wonderful hosting. Of course, to Asher, someone put into the chat that you're an insanely gifted oud player and musician, and I just want to echo that. Thank you so much. We look forward to the other programs. Uh, do sign up through our website, uclamaje.org. We'll take you to the right place to sign up for that, for these continued events and other events. For tonight's program, we want to thank our um, sponsors, who are the 
Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion Jewish Language Project and the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. Our co-sponsors are the Cantor's Assembly, the Sephardic Educational Center, and the Sephardic Studies University of Washington Strom Center for Jewish Studies. We're thankful to all of our sponsors and co-sponsors. It's really a wonderful partnership and a great opportunity for us to present Sephardi Mizrahi culture. Wishing you all a very good evening and a big thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone.